joined tonight by visiting professor at King's College London, Andrew McLeod. Prof, very good evening to you. Welcome to the program. Let's start with why the United Nations has been so ineffective in stopping the build-up to this invasion and the three days of war which we've seen so far. Well, it's very simple to answer that question. For the United Nations to act on any threat to international peace and security, it needs an endorsement through the Security Council. And all five permanent members of the Security Council have a veto. One of the permanent members of the Security Council is Russia. So whenever you have a permanent five member of the Security Council involved in conflict, be it the United States, China, Russia, France, the UK, uh, etc., you're deadlocked because the Security Council will be vetoed by that permanent five member. And just on that point, there have been some suggestions, some calls for Russia to lose its place on mm -hmm. the Security Council. Now, that has not happened before, to my knowledge. How difficult mm -hmm. would it be? It's impossible. I mean, the Ukrainian amb ambassador has called for Russia to be removed from the Security Council. Now, there's two uh, avenues you could look at. One is removing Russia. Now, the permanent five was set up to be permanent. It is possible to remove a member of the United Nations, but that requires a recommendation of the Security Council. And again, Russia has a veto. So for Russia to be removed from the Security Council, it would, it would need to be removed from the United Nations, and it would only be removed from the United Nations if Russia itself agreed, and that's just not going to happen. Mm -hmm. But actually, the argument that the Ukrainian ambassador has is a little bit more technical. The UN Charter says the permanent five is made up of China, France, United States, United Kingdom, and the Union of Socialist Soviet Republics. So the Ukrainians are saying that Russia should never be there because the USSR ceased to exist. However, when the USSR ceased to exist, there were two avenues of international law about what would happen to the countries left over, Russia and all the other republics. If you are a small part of the country and you break away, you can be called a successor state. That is a new country after the old one broke up and you have no existing rights or liabilities from the previous country and you've got to renegotiate them all. Mm -hmm. However, the largest part of the country that breaks up is often called the continuing state where all the former rights and liabilities of the continuing country exist in the continuing state. And Russia, and at the time, all the Soviet republics agreed that Russia was the continuing state to the Soviet Union, not the successor state to the Soviet Union, and therefore it is quite valid for Russia to have the USSR seat. Mm -hmm. In a very similar way, when the international community changed its recognition of China in the 1970s from the Republic of China, that is the China that sits in Taiwan, to the People's Republic of China, that's the China that sits in Beijing, because both Taiwan and Beijing claim to have been the government for all of China, they just simply said that it is the same China with a different name and a different government. And that's how China kept the seat. I so suppose you're not going to get sorry you're not going to get China to ruffle the feathers, but you're also not going to get United Kingdom to ruffle the feathers because if Scotland breaks away with their upcoming referendum that Nicola Sturgeon says they're going to have, then England will claim to be the continuing state to the United Kingdom for purposes of Security Council membership. And I suppose the other issue with uh, shall we say, changing or limiting the powers of the permanent members of mm. the Security Council would be that all of them have really at some point abused their veto power to either take action that was ab seen as abusive, yeah. invasive on other territory at any given point in history. Well, that's right. To change the powers of the permanent members of the Security Council, you'd have to get the agreement of the permanent members of the Security Council. And they kind of like having this veto and they kind of like these powers, so it's highly unlikely that anything will change. How democratic then is the Security Council, I wonder, for an institution that itself prides in the protection of the democratic system? Well, that's a very good point. I mean, the Permanent Five was set up to be elite over and above the other members of the United Nations. It's left over from the powers that existed in 1945. Is it democratic? No, it's not but it wasn't intended to be either. Remember, the vast majority of countries in the world are not democratic countries. 
what hope then is there for the non-permanent members of the council if they wish to bring about any change, but also, more broadly, hold the permanent members accountable for actions such as what we're seeing Russia do today in Ukraine? Yeah, it's almost impossible, although you can have referrals coming from the General Assembly to the International Criminal Court, for example. There are possibilities for that to happen in the future. But the real politic of this is Russia is invading Ukraine and there's nothing anyone else can do short of having a full-scale war with Russia that no one wants to have. Professor Andrew McLeod, visiting professor at London's King's College, thank you very much for your time tonight, sir. Thank you.